Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luke Tannen. I'm Executive Director of Chicago Innovation, and I'm excited to welcome all of you to today's virtual Chicago Innovation event, Innovating More with Less, presented by our diamond sponsor, Theron Technology Solutions. You know, I think we've all been forced to innovate, try to innovate more with less these days. You know, even, even my two four-year-old boys have been trying to do that. Uh, you know, they can't do the typical things that they like to do every summer uh, that they have access to. So, you know, to give you an example, just a couple hours ago, they found my wife's uh, bottle of pink shaving cream uh, and decided to cover their entire bodies in it. And to show you that it's true, here's something she texted me just an hour ago. Uh, pretty innovative, I thought. But kidding aside, you know, the title of the event says it all. Innovation has never been more vital. And for a lot of us, resources have never been so hard to come by. So how can we amp up our innovation efforts while still working within our means? And that is the question that today's panel is going to address. If you have a question for the panel, please send it to us via the Zoom Q&A, which we're gonna save the last 15 minutes for audience questions. We also received a lot of questions from you in advance, so we'll have those on hand too. Um, and also keep an eye out for a couple polling questions because we wanna hear from you, the audience. Before we get started, I wanna thank our great, fantastic Chicago Innovation sponsors who support everything that we do throughout the year, starting with our diamond sponsors, Theron Technology Solutions, which again is the presenter of, this, of today's event, uh, as well as diamond sponsors, SMS Assist, Accenture and Wintrust, gold sponsors, Comcast Business and Exelon, Silver sponsor, Vetter Price. Bronze sponsors, Thompson Coburn, Energy BBDO, Crown Castle and Granger. And our media partners, WBBM News Radio, Cranes, NBC5 Chicago, Clear Channel Outdoor, and Intersection. Next, I'd like to hand it off to the co founder of Chicago Innovation and the president of Kuzmarski Innovation, Tom Kuzmarski. Hi, everyone. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. You know, over the past 19 years, since I started Chicago Innovation, I've sure seen a wide array of different breakthrough, new products, new services, and new businesses emerge in Chicago. They came from both large corporations and small startups, but also from nonprofits and for-profits. So it's really been the creation of a wonderful innovation ecosystem right here in Chicago. What I've seen as common in all of them is the ability to be resilient, flexible, and focused on their own customer or consumers' problems, issues, and needs. Today, we certainly are in a challenging time, and in a time where we have to learn how to innovate more with less. Innovation is more important today than ever before. And we're so thrilled to have a great group of panelists with us today to be able to talk about this topic. And to moderate the group is our good friend, Nancy Ryshinsky, who's the COO of the Xeno Group, a global communications agency and last year's Agency of the Year Award winner. You know, she has spent more than 30 years in the agency world as a strategic counselor, creative leader, and champion of, of innovation. At Xeno, she also oversees the agency's global media network and innovation task force. She and her team manage brand reputation, marketing communications, and digital engagement for clients like Hyatt, Coca-Cola, Lenovo, Zebra Technologies, Pizza Hut, and LK. And importantly, she is a former Chicago Innovation Awards co-host and Chicago Innovation Board member. Please welcome Nancy Ryshinsky. Thank you very much, Tom, and hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. I'm excited to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. We'll get right to it. First up, Matt Lewisman, who's the Chief Operating Officer from Theron Technology Solutions. Matt has over 20 years of experience across financial services, consulting, and software implementation. He's an industry-leading expert in data management services and strategy. Next up, Amanda Lanner, the CEO of Jellyvision, a company that was named a top 10 best place to work in Chicago by the Chicago Tribune and the number one place for millennials to work in Chicago by Cranes. Amanda herself was selected as CEO of the year by the Illinois Technology Association and Built in Chicago's Moxie Awards. Welcome, Amanda. Then we've got Ron Garrier, 
the Chief Information Officer for the State of Illinois. Big job. Ron drives innovation and technology efforts for a $42 billion government organization that serves over 12 million people across the state. And then finally, Brian Hoff, our friend, who's the VP of Innovation from Exelon. Brian manages innovation, that is his full-time job for Exelon, which is a $36 billion energy company. Uh, Exelon was selected uh, most innovative energy company by Fast Company, and Brian himself has been named to the Tech 50 by Cranes. Great group who bring all different perspectives on innovation and specifically innovating more with less during these times. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in to the questions. So let's start with um, something general. I think everybody on this call knows that innovation, whether it's innovating a product service or a process, it always starts with identifying a need. So I'd love to ask each of our panelists, what are the needs that your organization is addressing now and has that evolved um, or pivoted at all um, during COVID? Is it, is it different during these times? Why don't we start with you, Matt? Hi, Nancy, thank you. Um, we're a services company. Uh, so apart from being a standing board for clients, I think a lot of people just wanted to talk just to make sure that they weren't by themselves. What we've seen is more of a, an evolution than a direct pivot. We're looking at uh, companies that are leveraging the associated data uh, with adoption of collaborative and remote working based technologies and trying to basically leverage that, uh, whether it's within analytics or being able to kind of track or think about how they can kind of better utilize that data to get more of a business insight. So we've just seen basically more of a extension of that over the last you know, six months that people were looking at you know, last year as well. How about you, Brian? So at Exxon, if you stand back and really look at, at our holding company and all the different business units we have, a lot of it does come back to clean, affordable, reliable power for all that we serve. And we've got 10 million regulated customers, around 2 million competitive. Um, if, when I really think about COVID, right, your guys are hopefully all home now with your lights on, right? And your factories are running, if you are still in the fact running, with the power that we provide. So I think energy has gotten even more critical during this time. And you, when you really think, and we'll talk more about a lot of the ways that we serve, we've got to be more innovative to those customers, but ultimately how we even deliver. Because we now have half of our workforce working from home. We still need to deliver on those services. And as we're doing that, we're also challenged to, as we provide the critical service. Great. Ron, how about, how's the state? How are you managing this for the state within all that the state is dealing with? How do you... Uh, innovate during these times and how has it changed? All right, so thank you again everyone for having me on. Um, for me, it starts with a deep breath <laughs> um, and then it continues on to, for the state, I mean, where I, I came from private sector prior to this role 20 plus years and working remotely was just normal. Um, having people in Cebu, Mumbai, Costa Rica, wherever it is, you work and you work remotely. Um, at the state, Working remotely was actually completely foreign, actually it was not allowed in many cases. So um, given that the state employees uh, in many regards are essential workers, getting them to work remotely was the first thing. And within 72 hours, we were able to spin up 20,000 instances where they could work from home. Um, but once you do that, everyone who knows on the call, your footprint of your cyber risk increases to everyone's home. Um, so making sure we had security around that, data around it, so the first is getting people working remotely, getting them comfortable with that, um, the psychology of that. The second part, then it was just full go. Let's get our websites up to snuff. Websites for the state were never a, necess a necessity. They were more like a nice to have. Um, now is the primary point of channel of communication. Um, and the third one I'd say, and there's a lot more buckets, but the you know, top three, the third one would be data analytics. Governor Pritzker relies on us to provide him the latest on where to put ventilators, where to put testing centers, and so we have to make sure we have the analytics accurate because um, again, we're basing everything off of science. And so I would say in the first week or two after that first deep breath, um, we got to get going. So that's kind of what our focus has been. Perfect, thank you. And Amanda, how about you? What's this, give us a picture of what's happening inside Jelly Vision as it relates to innovation during these times. Yeah, so Jelly Vision makes a platform called Alex that helps employees stay on track to retire by making sure they have enough money and insurance to cover their short and long-term health and financial needs. That's our business. 
And now uh, in a matter of two months, we went from a record low unemployment to an 80 year record high. And 70% of Americans have now been financially impacted by COVID-19, either through a job loss, a pickup, or a furlough for themselves or their family member. So financial wellness, which has always been take your medicine, is now very top of mind for employers and employees alike. Big, big change in terms of focus and importance as, as we have one out of five Americans currently unemployed. Mm -hmm. Lots more we can pick up there, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. But one of the things I want to invite everyone on the call to do at this time, because um, we want to make sure this is highly interactive, um, we're going to do a quick poll for everybody on the call, and then it'll give our panelists something to react to. Paul, you want to pull up our first poll? So folks, the question is, of the following options, and this is a loaded question because you can't pick all four, what would you choose to have an unlimited amount of? Time, money, people, or ideas? So pick, pick the one and then hit submit and uh, we'll have our results quickly and it'll give, uh, give our panelists maybe, maybe a surprise, maybe not. I'm gonna fill it in myself. Okay, and while you're all filling that in, we'll go to some more questions for the panelists. Um, I think we're all starved for optimism. So let's go for some optimism here. Despite all of the challenges that um, surround us right now, um, this is an innovative group. So the time is ripe for creative solutions to solve those problems. Are there any, are you seeing any opportunities um, in 2020, rest of 2020 and 21, opportunities to increase innovation within your organizations? Um, Amanda, let's start with you on that one. So are we going to increase innovation? You, you have give, to. Give us some reasons for optimism. So it's a, it, you, you have to innovate. If you look back on any time of economic duress, the companies that, that come out of it okay don't stand still. They don't put their heads in the sand and hope for the best. They absolutely innovate their way out of it. So you can think about it as, as running. You know, You do your daily jog, it's fine. You go a lot faster when you're chased by a bear. We're all being chased by a bear right now. And that is going to lead to incredible breakthroughs and incredible innovation. That discomfort is where the growth happens. It is an unbelievable time to sit down with your customers and more likely than ever, they're going to tell you the truth about what matters. And that leads to you actually creating solutions of value. Um, I think that all the fundamentals of business stay close to your customers, stay close to your employees, communicate excessively, uh, get clear on priorities, separate what matters from what's worthwhile. All of those things just come to a head when times are tight, and it's a great chance to get really clear on what matters and, and drive faster forward accordingly. I think this is gonna be a time of this ambiguity and uncertainty is an opportunity for a lot of cool breakthroughs to happen. I, I agree. Um, that was a great list, by the way. Matt, let's go over to you. Do, you. do you feel like there's a bear running behind you? I think I see it now. <laughs> no, it's a, it's Talk a... to us about how you see, you, can you find some room for optimism within your organization and the chance to do more innovation versus less? Absolutely. I mean, I concur with everything that Amanda said. You have to innovate. Um, I think that one of the things that I've seen more is just more dedicated focus. People are now really just channeling what's really important. So obviously, you know, things like digitization, automation were things that aren't new. Um, I think that what people are doing now is really just driving that focus and just really homing onto that. I mean, I've, I've heard stories now that, you know, what used to take three to 12 months to get approval within a large institution can literally take between one and two weeks now. So I think that now this is forcing people just to think differently. And why do we need these processes? Why do we need this red tape? So I think the once we get out of this chapter, I think that a lot of people will realize what's really important and what's not. Um, I think that a lot of people have adapted to this work from home environment. You know, I look at the company that I've got and there were some people that were used to the work from home balance, um, you know, and we got frustrated that they were coming in every day into the city if they lived in the suburbs. And I think that now what we've shown is that we can work remotely uh, and you are more focused and more dedicated. So I think that we can try and be optimistic and take the positives that it will basically make the company better. Ron, want to add anything there in terms of reasons to be optimistic within the state? Yeah, so I'm, I'm touching on, I mean, Amanda's response was masterful. It's like, I'm not one to kind of talk past the close. And Matt added to it. But 
the one thing when he said red tape, you guys got to know where I where I work. Um, <laughs> it, it has changed, honestly. There, I had a so when I joined, I had a three year plan for certain things, and it was three years because I just knew it was going to take through good, get through procurement and other things. It's just going to take a while. Um, but to me, they were low hanging fruit in my past private sector life in public. It was considered like a daunting task. So when I say something like a chat bot, chat bot on a website, everyone's like, well, we've had that for 10 years. At the state, we've never had those. And so when we started doing that so we could get through our websites quicker for our residents, um, it was approved within three days. And a lot of times now, um, I'm on Governor Pritzker's um, bat phone and he's on mine, and I just ping him on something. And the fact that he has a um, appreciation for technology given his past roles before becoming governor, it really just um, expedites things a lot quicker. Um, so for me, that is exciting. That's something to be happy about. And the last thing I'll say is we also support um, the Illinois Century Network. So all the kids and young adults who are doing e-learning, we are now fast tracking some of the things we're doing to increase and harden that. Not only so they can have better performance, which is important, but also for bad actors who um, are affecting government sectors with ransomware. So all the things that were like, well, nice to get that in a couple of years from now have accelerated to today. And the red tape that you usually associate with um, a government um, honestly has been fast tracked. And I hope this becomes the norm. Like we don't need a pandemic to wait, make people realize digital is here. Um, but for me, that is um, some excitement finding like I drink Caipirinhas, which is a Brazilian drink of limes. Um, we're making Caipirinhas out of limes right now. And, and <laughs> it's, it's feeling pretty good. That's the fancier way of making lemonade out of lemons. Caipirina is out of limes. Yes. I love it. There you go. <laughs> um, Paul, do we have our poll results? We do. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, Brian, what do you see here in the poll results? Any surprises? People want time and they want money. No stock there. Yeah, it's funny. It I was sitting there thinking a lot about the money. I, I debate this a lot in, um, in, and I'll give you a couple of my thoughts is it's almost like the bear analogy that we were just talking to. We're probably going to re overuse this thing, but you want the bear chasing you, right? And to get things moving and you want a scarcity of money. So I actually think when people say they want a bunch of money to go figure something out, I actually think you get the most innovative ideas when you don't have the money because then it makes you really think outside the box. How do I get creative? How do I go do that differently without, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever the number is that's big for your organization. So, um, you know, I, I can understand why they put money in the poll, but I actually think you don't want it because I think you'll spend it on a bunch of things that you kind of, at the end of the day, you're going to have regret that you did. So I would really do minimal viable products. For me, and it's a lot of the things we talk about, like, how do I go get something quickly out to my customers, have them actually see if there's a value, iterate, and then spend a little bit of money at time at stage gates. That to me is the best way to do any of these things. And we've got a lot of different examples of things that we're starting to do that way. And I'll even just use a quick example is like, we've been doing drone based asset inspection, right? How do we actually get a drone to go out and do something that used to take somebody in a helicopter or two people in a crew, right? A lot of these new technologies you can advance and it's more efficient to do it that way. So, and they're not superly expensive. Right? A drone is not that expensive. So go out and do some of these things, quickly experiment, and I'm, I'm really optimistic. Great, thank you. Um, Amanda, let's go back to you for a minute. Um, you, I, I guess you as the CEO have a lot of influence over um, what gets prioritized uh, within the organization. So just let's start with you, sort of let's talk about resources again the theme of this panel is innovating more with less so how do you continue to prioritize innovation when your resources are more constrained um would love your take on that i think i think how do you prioritize innovation i think first of all i think about it as everybody's job we don't have an innovation department some of our most innovative departments are like it and finance uh, everyone can be innovative. So the first thing I remember is companies don't innovate. Organizations don't innovate. People do. Uh, and I, I kind of apply like, what's, why can't big companies innovate compared to small companies, right? Big companies have a lot of vertical specialists. 
Small companies have lots of generalists who can do lots and lots of jobs. Uh, big companies don't trust their employees and build policies and protocols that make it harder for people to do their jobs. And small companies all know each other and trust each other and can move really quickly accordingly. And there are all kinds of, of differences about you know, big companies and small companies. So when we try to prioritize innovation, first of all, great ideas come from anywhere. Listen. The people closest to the problems always have the best ideas, which is almost never the CEO. And uh, remember, it is about finding your tinkerers in the company, the people who innovate and like to try new things and creating runway and removing blockers for them and, and ultimately trusting. And to me, that means being really, really candid about what matters, about where you think you can extract value. Be clear about your business strategy and your competitive situation. And then be patient with failures. Let it be messy. Let it not go to plan uh, and create runway for people to kind of, you know, break eggs in the kitchen. Uh, but, but, you know, prioritizing innovation is an expectation that it's everywhere, not somewhere in particular. Great answer. Matt, um, back still on the topic of kind of resource gaps and, and how to do more with less. Um, Give us your sense of sort of what are the what are the opportunities that companies are missing that, that you see when it comes to, in your case, specifically how they leverage technology. So the ability to use technology smarter to solve problems within the company. What's your view on that? Um, I've seen a lot of cases where products get implemented, but the final 20% isn't. And it's always people just get bored and tedious. And that to me is where you don't realize the full benefit. But, but to me, technology is really just the supporting mechanism for doing an activity or a capability. Um, it's really the information, the data behind it, that really is the lifeblood of any organization. And if you can kind of take that and harness it and then realize how can I leverage that to innovate, how to do things better, whether it is giving better client service or it is making things more efficient internally. So I look at it as technology is really a mechanism. It's really then how you basically think about the information, the data, and I'm a data geek at heart. So um, it's really how you can take that and really leverage that for the benefit of your company and just circle it through. Um, Brian and Ron, I want to go to you guys with a um, question about collaboration. When we're talking about innovating more with less, that's all about efficiency and being efficient. And one way to do that is through collaboration. And Amanda started to touch on this um, as well. Can you talk about, um, I guess, from your vantage point, what are some of the ways that you're collaborating both internally and externally? Um, we'll, start, we'll start with you, Ron. You know, are you seeing more opportunities for collaboration between the public and private sector? We'll go to you first, and then Brian would love for you to add to that and talk about, because I know Exelon has done a lot of collaboration with startups would love your um, perspective on that. So Ron, over to you. A great question, Nancy. So um, when I started about a year and a half ago, um, I rebooted something called the Chicago Innovation Council. And it was a group that meet, meets quarterly. And we talk about all the challenges that we're having in the public sector and how our members in the private sector um, solving those issues. Um, and the premise of this is that you're not competing with the state of Illinois. If anything, it's in your best interest to make sure the state of Illinois is more efficient um, and actually is doing the right thing with the taxpayer dollar. And so, for example, we have Rouse, we have McDonald's, we have Discover, a lot of great companies in the Chicago and in, in Illinois at large. And we throw all these ideas and these use cases and say, well, we did this or we did that. Or in some cases, we talk about um, favorable pricing that they've gotten. So we just compare notes. Um, and so a lot of that actually went really well because when we decided to go full bore um, online for remote, we really started understanding how the rest of Chicago companies are doing it. And we started innovating there. Another thing real quick before I pass the baton to Brian is recently you saw that um, one thing we're tackling is a digital divide. And actually Amanda and I were on a previous, uh, another panel a while back talking about this topic and how can we improve the digital divide and not just rural versus urban or suburban versus Chicago, um, but just at large, right? Um, kids now have to work from home and there's huge challenges, not just devices, but just access to broadband. And so about a month ago, my dates are all blurry like everyone else's, um, um, a, a group of private investors, including Penny Pritzker and others, 
um, brought together $50 million to provide broadband to all Chicago students and CPS. And so that is just one of many examples. The one thing I love about my hometown here in Chicago um, is that everyone has a very good heart. Everyone wants to do the right thing. Uh, and now due to this pandemic, it's being a little bit more focused, which is great. Focus, like Brian said earlier, um, creates energy in my opinion, and scarcity also creates energy. And so I think that is what's happening right now. My bigger concern is don't make this a flavor of the month. This has to be a continuous thing, right? So that's kind of how we're doing the corporate slash government um, partnerships. Perfect, thank yeah, you. Brian? If I were, and again, probably pull a lot of this stuff together, I agree with Amanda a lot is we have 34,000 people inside Exelon and we have that everybody's responsibility is to drive innovation. So when you ask me about collaboration, I can tell you we have 34,000 people doing it. Yes, we have groups that are, you know, titled innovation like mine, but we first part is if 34,000 people collaborate, do things 1% better, that's 34,000% better. I mean, just think about the power of having everybody. So I do believe everybody in a corporation, you know, can, can definitely collaborate. And we actually have a platform that we put um, challenges out there and have other employees co collaborate together on I've got this problem and here's an idea how I can solve it and they help each other and you get the citizen community of people wanting to help each other inside the company towards common goals because again they're fellow employees and they want to help you and you get amazing diverse ideas perspectives and I just see things really flourish you asked me specifically on collaborating with startups too and we've got multiple programs one of them we call dancing with startups so we actually do, and we've been running it for about seven years, we invite startups to come in with challenges and problems that we have, and they come in and pitch to us. So we do a, you know, open selection of hundreds of startups. We get down to an ultimately like 10 to 14. They come in pitch, and then we'll do some type of an engagement with them. And we have found it very beneficial that we're actually helping them, you know, with their business, you know, their business challenges of a startup of getting scale and we are a large enterprise across the US, we can scale and help them even with the connections and access and resources that we have. So I've seen that beneficial on both sides. And then recently we just launched a, um, we call it 2C2I, it's our climate change impact initiative where we're actually investing directly into startups to help them hit their um, city sustainability plans. So these aren't trying to have startups help Exxon, it is for us to help Chicago, us help DC, us help Baltimore, all the cities in which we serve, we're collaborating with them, providing both money and in-kind resources. So I think we're helping take some of that collaboration with, with startups to another level. Hey Nancy, can I jump in? There was oh, a- there Please was a do. Comment. That was a fantastic answer, thank you. There, there was a comment in the, in the Q&A that came up. It said, are any, any of these companies really doing more with less? Right, is, is Chicago's budget really been cut? Are we really doing more with less? And I just wanna point out a couple of things. For sure, most businesses saw revenue plummet. Ours certainly did. We sell based on employees. So our companies went from having thriving businesses to no revenue and no employees overnight. Uh, and that absolutely impacted our business. And we quickly implemented a hiring freeze and a spending freeze. So as people left the company, we were not able to backfill. But capital and human constraints aren't the only ones. Every business in this country has a lack of access of clarity and security. And you gotta still innovate with less of that too. So I, it, is, it is different. Like you used to kind of have a pattern recognition of what was gonna happen next year. We really don't. Yeah. We do not know when our employees are gonna go back to the offices, if at all. We do not know if employers are gonna be bullish or conservative next year. We don't know if we're in a U or a W in terms of recovery. And I wanna say like doing more with less isn't just money. Security and clarity matter a lot too, and we all have less of that. Great answer. Um, and I thank just, you for that rich, question. I just, Rich had a question and I was like, that's a good question. Like we should, <laughs> we should be honest about what we're doing with less of. Well, and, and to, to build on that, I'll ask the other panelists, because um, I think there was a second question. So Maria Thompson's question, you know, please discuss how you've been impacted by COVID and what your organization has less of due to, due to COVID that's impacting your ability to innovate. So Amanda kicked us off there. Um, Matt, you want to respond? Um, well, obviously, outside of the, the social contact, um, it's impacted creativity. Um, I think the, you know, as much as everyone is doing a fantastic job in this current environment, uh, I personally miss the social interaction, the whiteboarding, the creative discussions. Um, I, I definitely 
see that people are more polite on video conferences. You don't get a lot of the uh, uh, the arguments uh, on calls uh, that I used to have in the office, where you're trying to kind of draw ideas and work out how to kind of implement like a you know a year program. That's something that that we've kind of missed. Um, you know, from an impact perspective, we've been fortunate enough uh, where certain things have slowed down. We've just put resources on something else. And um, it's just been more of a, you know, let's all bed down, let's all work this together. This is a, a chat. So I was initially going on weeks one through 14. And I think the last few weeks I've gone into month four or five. So, um, you know, we're talking about when do we go back to the office, if we go back into the office. Um, I think it's just, we just have to kind of keep going. And, and what I try and do is do calls with the team during the week. Um, but people obviously have everyone's like cell phone number. So text messaging now is, is the new norm. It's to me making yourself available um, that you can just be there for people. Ron, anything you want to add there? Uh -uh. I, the, the, I think we probably have more of a line of sight into what the state has less of on a given day, but, but please chime in. Yeah, so I'll just kind of, um, add a little bit to what Matt said. It's the mental health, honestly, of the staff. Um, everyone, there's an exhaustion. And if you've been in technology for a while, you know that there's cycles. You launch something, and then there's a, a break, a breather, and then you go on to the next one, right? Horizon, horizon, horizon. And when, like, like Amanda said, we don't know what the next horizon really looks like. And if you're constantly in this emergency setting, um, people just get tired. And when tired happens, um, I have concerns about that because mental health is something that we don't talk about a lot in our nation. We need to do more of, in my opinion. Um, my sister is a PhD in psychology, runs a nonprofit here in Chicago, and she is my person I lean on. It's like, hey, Judith, um, this is really starting to bug me. I have that conversation. So I think that's the one thing I would say um, that's, that's a concern for me. The other one I would say when it comes to um, all this is at the end of the day, the struggle we have is that the systems we have in place, and this is not a, I'm not gonna be political, so I'm not gonna talk about anyone who made a decision five, 10 years ago, right? But the systems were not designed the way they are today. They're just never in, in the wildest dreams thought that unemployment security would be hitting 1.8 million hits a day. It was designed for 20 hit, 20,000 hits a day. So 20,000 compared to 2 million almost. It just wasn't designed for that. So, yep. um, making the right bets and securing that because um, I think that's important to everyone. We have to do it right. Um, and so we're catching up on lost time on certain things. Um, I'll say that's my biggest concern is um, making those investments in legacy, catching up, and again, the mental health of our people. And so what I do in the latter, Tech Talk Tuesdays, I do the engagements, drop-ins, I do everything I can to show engagement the best I can. Um, and then you throw in uh, the social issues that we're having in our country today. It's just coming at us, right? And 2020 is going to be one of those, oh, I remember what I was doing in 2020. A little bit of everything. And we all will be kind of thinking back to this and like, we got past it. And we will. Oh, yeah. Brian, you want to add? No, it, it, it's funny. I, I can't believe we're all talking mental health. Um, but, I, but I'll go down there for a quick path, too. Is I noticed directly on my staff, I'll just say, that I get concerned about it. And there's been some things I can't talk about. But we've had serious issues happening with all of this. So. I used to kind of uh, more lightly think about it, say, yeah, yeah, mental health, it is a real thing. So it is something that we should all take extremely serious. And, you know, when I think about just my direct employees, or I think about the employees I work with in Exxon, um, I get really worried about it. So it is something definitely for us to all to consider everybody who's on, you know, listen to our you know, podcast here or, or whatever this webinar. Um, and on the other pieces of less similar, my teams don't have as direct access to customers and to internal business, you know, uh, businesses that we work with, to our labs, to our tools that we use. So we're trying to use these web tools and others. And we've had to have occasionally where somebody like on my team has to still go out with one of our businesses or field. And then you're dealing with how do I wear a mask, right? How do I have the right PPE in place? So it is um, difficult. And then as a company, you stand back, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, as you know, factories and businesses shut down, that's less load on the system. So all of a sudden, we're not getting the revenue that Exxon used to. So then that has a direct effect. A lot of the programs that I run lost funding, right? So it is a um, new world that we're all dealing with. I am though, you know, I don't wanna sound negative, I'm extremely optimistic. 
because I can see that we'll get through this and we're going to get through it stronger. But it is a, we're definitely all in it together. And you start to realize that so quickly that we think that like, you know, we have critical employees. Well, the state has critical employees. The food workers are critical. Who's really a critical employee? And you start to really watch that definition. It starts to get to be how, who's not critical? Because we need to support everyone. Well said. I think it's time for another poll. Let's get everybody back uh, sharing their thoughts. Paul, you want to put the second poll up for us? Okay, so this time we're looking at what is the number one driver of innovation at your company? Maybe when the panel talks about this, we'll talk about whether that's changed. But the four choices are the needs of your customers, the need for increasing internal efficiencies, the need to stay relevant in an increasingly competitive market, or a culture that makes innovation a top priority. And again, unfair that you can't pick all of the above, but that's how we roll here. Okay, so if everyone could take a minute and fill that in, and while we're waiting, um, just another question, and we've started to sort of get to this a little bit, but innovation kind of traditionally, in the classic sense, usually requires kind of a long-term view, you know, long-term thinking, you're innovating for the long game for your company or organization. But as Amanda said, and everybody has echoed, you know, we, it's impossible to see even what next month holds right now. We're really all in this sort of short-term thinking mode right now. So question for each of you, are you, have you shifted the way that you do innovation to get to, to sort of pivot to more of a short-term view? And if so, how do you do that? Amanda, let's start with you. Yeah, typically we say our problems should be enduring and our solutions should be built iteratively and quickly over time. Uh, and COVID threw that in, you know, for a bit of a loop where we, we very quickly built a lot of COVID responsive products that we hope will be obsolete within two years. Um, but in general, it's trying to say, are we solving enduring problems uniquely and specifically in the moment? So we, we try not to build products that take three years to launch. We try to say, what can we do that's relevant in four months? What can we do that's relevant four more months after that? And are we constantly solving valuable problems in the eyes of our customers? Which is why going back to them and saying, what do you really care about? You just cut your budgets. What didn't get cut? What is an important priority right now? Uh, and that helps make sure that your innovation is actually saleable. And I think part of, and again, maybe this is, it's easier in your case, because you also said this, you don't have an innovation department. It's sort of built into the fabric of what you do. So it's not about quickly moving money around or having to restructure the organization. It's kind of inherently the way you're approaching. And, and to be clear, it's because I failed. I set up an innovation department three years ago and it didn't work. And it really, it really became like, well, who's in the innovation department and why are they innovated? Every, every, everyone can, can improve margin, improve top line, improve customer experience, improve your ability to hire talent. Like really innovation needs to happen everywhere to have a successful business. Great. Uh, Ron? Anything you want to add there about sort of short-term innovation versus long-term and, and how you do that? Yeah, so when, after 19 years of Toyota, I started just speaking Toyota ease all the time. Um, and Kaizen is something that I kind of grew up with. And Kaizen, again, is continuous improvement. Like every opportunity is a micro opportunity to kind of create innovation. And so when I brought that idea to the state, we started actually thinking about those smaller bites and enough of those smaller bites are sparks, and enough of those sparks become flames, become infernos, become something that's innovative. And so um, for me, every single individual has a micro decision to make that could become something that is a macro innovation. So I challenge everyone on the team to be an innovator. Like everyone should be focused on data, everyone should be focused on security. Um, and so one thing that doesn't get a lot of touting, but it, it happened during this pandemic, is the state went from 196 systems for financial reporting to one, we're on one ERP system. Mm -hmm. um, we went from 30% to 95% um, about a month ago. Um, and the reason that's innovative and exciting for hopefully for people, for the last five to 10 years or so, we were ranked 47th, 49th, and 49th when it comes to state accounting reporting. Um, we we're dead last almost every single time. And what this means now is now that we have this one system of record for the entire state, I'm going to start now applying machine learning, AI on top of a common system 
Um, and now that everyone's working from home and we're doing less paper, I'm also reducing print consumption, which is paper consumption. So I'm, I'm using this new system to kind of be a platform for more innovation that can sit on top of it. And now I can provide dashboards to each agency head, and there's 54 agency heads I have to kind of work with, and each one has their own CIO to make sure that they're innovating with the new platforms, make sure those investments are actually becoming an innovative platform. So, so for me, there's a lot of that happening right now, but again, I'm trying to distinguish Kaizen and innovation. There is a distinct difference between the two, but everyone should really feel like everyone else said on the call, you have to find out what those opportunities are. And I'm, I'm proud to say people with 30 plus years of experience with the state um, are really some of the most innovative. They're like, oh my God, someone's listening to me now. Someone wants to hear my story. Like Ron's talking to me about this. And then they're actually the ones that's sparking that change. So it's pretty exciting because again, through adversity, this is coming out, out of it. Huge undertaking. Um, Paul, do we have the results of the poll yet? Should we pop that up? Look at that. Love it when this works. Um, so maybe not hugely surprising that the needs of your customers is first up there. Um, Brian, you see anything here you want to comment on? No, I, it, it, I think we've all said it and, I, and I'll give a little bit of flavor from Exelon. Right? And again, our purpose statement is to power a cleaner, brighter future for our customers and communities. And you know, so that is customer first. And then to your point is when all of a sudden COVID hit, and I'll give some examples that I don't know if everybody on this audience thinks about, like we still are running nuclear power plants. And all of a sudden you're getting to the point of how do I do a refuel outage that we plan for over two years during COVID? And I'm gonna go bring a thousand workers into a community when hotels are shut down. How am I gonna actually go do this? And you're gonna say, well, work from home. They can't work from home. They're going in to do a critical activity of the required maintenance and putting fuel in. So then it had to be some really innovative thinking to work with the hotels, figure out how to feed the people, how to house the people, how to keep everybody safe, how to contract tracing. You know, all of those type of things had to be quickly figured out. And it wasn't a, you know, here's a big, you know, CEO is going to determine this. This really was some coordination of how do we figure it out at one and then share that best practice back to the collaboration. So then you end up seeing that very short term need of refuel a nuclear power plant or keep the grid running because that's what the immediate need is. And we had to find a lot of innovative solutions really quickly to deliver to our customer commitments, right? Some of the longer term things we did kind of pause. I'm starting to see some of them back. Like we're working with the Department of Energy on how do we actually produce hydrogen at some of our plants. So now you see some of the R&D functions and other things coming in, which are really interesting, but those are more dedicated groups. So that's where I think you've got to really always balance in your innovation program. How do you have it for all, like Amanda's mentioned and Ron and, I, and everyone, but then you still have these like more R&D specific, more of the 5X, 10X ones that have a dedicated team and collaborate what's going on. And you have to be able to do both. Right, and I think during critical times, you could go a little bit more back towards the core. And once you get the core back to stable, then you can start looking at more of the adjacent adjacencies again. Hey, um, Matt, there's a question in the Q&A. You had mentioned before, one of the things you miss is the you know, whiteboarding and social interaction and, and sitting with team members and, and brainstorming together. Uh, the question is, are you facilitating virtual brainstorming <laughs> Or how are you sort of trying to simulate that process um, remotely? And question goes to all the panelists. Do you have any other suggestions for how you're doing this um, while everybody's working from home? Yeah, I mean, a, a, apart from obviously team by team or client by client pods, as we like to call them, um, we haven't actually been doing uh, like open forums, which I think that uh, we've been starting to talk about and we'll probably think about launching them soon. What, I've seen is, is definitely a lot more people are very open to talk. Uh, LinkedIn's been an unbelievable source for just sharing information, um, whether it is for us personally that we're looking for new clients to help support and, and really innovate and drive execution, um, or just people that might be in need of another opportunity just because of obviously the economy is not, not in, a, in, a, in a great state right now. And I've basically been able to reconnect with people that I used to work with in New York and in London uh, and obviously in Chicago, uh, even up to like 10 years ago, uh, just to see where kind of people have landed and, and what they're doing and what they're hearing. And I think that if there's an ability to start to bring all that together and start to spread that out again, um, you know, people that I know that have got into 
brand new kind of technical concepts of um, no code platforms. And for me to then go and create a partnership with someone that I knew like eight years ago um, with what he's trying to do and basically take that to some of my clients, I think that what virtually that we're doing is we're connecting more than we ever had because a lot of people have got, I don't want to call it free time. I think they're more focused on what they're spending their time on and that's allowing them to kind of just think a little bit more outside the box to be able to kind of say, well, where can I provide value? And even if it's not value for me, how can I kind of just pass that on? And I've seen a lot more of that, you know, really just non-selfish view uh, that people just wanted to kind of help everyone else out right now in this, in this current climate. I think you're right about that. Amanda, how about you? I, um, you talked about the fast innovation that goes on within Jelly Vision, but it's really hard when you're sitting home alone at your it's a team sport and and when you're sitting home alone trying to dream up the next big thing is it really just about now you're just doing it on a zoom i mean there has to be more <laughs> there has to be more is there any other any other tricks you guys have that are helping sort of promote that collaboration and creative thinking while everyone's at home we're a very tech enabled tech company we we have had a full stack of of remote tools from zoom to slack for years we we live on zoom already and so the transition to being stuck in our basements wasn't as hard as we thought it would be from a productivity perspective, but it is really hard from a cultural perspective. People yeah. miss people. So we in fact are launching more than we've ever launched, you know, in the prior years this year, work is getting done. What we're losing is community, culture, inspiration, you know, banter. And so I have a couple of thoughts about that. Um, the first is I considered myself to be a walk around CEO where I would see people and kind of over here and get the energy at the water cooler or the coffee station. And I was also really, I really relied on drinking. Uh, and by drinking, I don't just mean wine, but yeah, that too. But coffee or tea where I would say, let's go out of the office to get a drink. And that sheer change of scenery created a format for me that got people to talk. And that's gone because I don't leave my basement. And so now we're in a really, the best thing to me to come out of COVID is that when you ask people how they're doing, even remotely, they tell you the truth. Uh, th there is so much more humanity. Your dog is barking. Your kid won't leave you alone. You're trying to have a meeting. The guard's down. The work uniform is off. We're all wearing sweatpants, or at least I am. And I mean only sweatpants for 120 days. So it, it's, it's like the guard is down and like the humanity is coming through. And so you, you ask and you answer. So for us, it hasn't been productivity because we, we all are pro users of Zoom. We have their whiteboard and their collaboration tools. We have lived in Slack for five years. It is, it is trying to replace the humanity at work. Um, and, and so I think, I think the first part of it is you, you ask and allow people to answer and kind of say things like, it's okay to not be okay, how can I help? And the second thing is everything that I thought was so organic, me walking around and just seeing people, it now needs to become intentional. I now need to schedule it. I now yeah. need to not just like get lucky that this one engineer who's working on something I didn't know about has five minutes to tell me about it and I learn and I get to know about that person. Now it has to be a lot more intentional. There is no more organic, it is inorganic. And so sometimes it's awkward and less fun and people are like, what does she want? But uh, those, those are the two strategies. Like people are in fact more human in these weird times and you need to be open to it and have like IEQ and sensitivity and care. And the second is I think all CEOs who used to walk around, that's a myth. Nobody knew you were being intentional about it and now you actually have to be intentional. So people know that you care what they think. Um, th that's what I'd have to say. Love it. Ron, um, what's your take on that? How do you inject the humanity and how do you promote um, fast innovation and creative thinking when everybody's by themselves? Well, I'm a fellow lurker like Amanda, so I, I'm, I'm the type who walks. <laughs> and, dr and drinker. <laughs> I, can't, I can't answer that question at this point. Um, <laughs> um, so, but no, what I will say is that the interaction is something I think we all crave. I mean, at some point, uh, I have teenage kids, so I'm 20 and 21, and communication through text was the norm. Um, and I was never really too comfortable with that. So I like to get around, talk, understand what's going on, meet in the parking lot. The thing Amanda does, I do a lot of walking around the building. Um, those conversations, like when I used to drive my kids to practice, and they're sitting and seated next to me, those were the best conversations you have with the kids. And not saying that my um, employees are kids by any means, but it's a great communication way to kind of just get to know what's going on. And so that's miss. And so what we've done the best we can is we have stand up. Most companies have these, but for us it was relatively new. It's thing called Do It Daily. Our group is called Do It Department of Innovation Technology. I didn't name it. I inherited it. But we, we do it. We get it done. 
Um, and so we have stand-up meetings, we have huddles, um, and we actually do have a couple of happy hours. So I actually have a bar in, in my basement. So we have a happy hour and we just get everyone after hours, whatever. So trying to have that engagement, but really just talking about what's really going on beyond all the noise. And we, we treat every week like a sprint because this week it's this thing. And now this coming up week, there's another thing. And again, I try to not politicize my role, but again, the federal government sending agents to Chicago. And so now we have to be prepared and working with public safety and what does that mean? So the sprint for this week is what does this mean and how are we prepared for that? Next week, it'll be all the schools are gonna really start having a hardened plan, the colleges for back to school. What are we doing for that? So really just trying to keep that engagement and energy up. Um, it, I would like to think it's working, but as I said earlier, and we all have, mental health is something that's a concern of mine, um, but again, it's the engagement. And I do honestly miss the interactions. So I do walk around, I go down to, I was in Springfield earlier this week, and I literally just walked around. If anyone was in the office, I just sat down, masked on, and have a conversation. So I'm trying the best I can, but it's difficult. We're humans, and that interaction really brings this energy that we really crave. And weekly sprints. Brian, anything to, to add there? Anything else that you're doing to promote, uh, well, culture broadly, uh, mental well-being, and you know sort of creativity while everybody's hunkered down uh, it, it, and it's funny there's a lot of this is we're all in different industries but there is so much of it that's a diddle uh, i always did management by walking around too i completely miss a lot of that we have um every every day at four o'clock i have an unplugged call with my staff that we can actually unplug we have a rule that we can't talk about work once in a while there'll be a few things that come in we also are doing the drinking thing on on that call you know again of your choice of beverage um and you've got to figure out how to have those social things, social times. I have intentionally, all my direct reports, I've got even more time with them. We've kind of forced it has to be on camera so you can see each other. Um, I joke about it started, we used to hide when the kids came in the background. Now we're waving at the people's kids, we know everybody's names. So there's some of it that's getting a little bit more intimate because you're actually seeing peeks into people's house. You're starting to see what's in their background. And it's, it's really interesting. So you're almost shaming people if they don't turn on their camera or have the virtual background like I'm having right now where they're like, well, where is he really? Because he has a virtual background. So you've got to break those barriers down with your staff and, and, and be more human. And again, that helps on the mental health. Even my mental health, it helps just talking. And that's why, you know, if you find me, I love to talk. If you called me said, how's it going? You're going to hear. I'm not going to hold back. <laughs> Awesome. I want to make sure we're, we've got just a few minutes left. And if there's any other questions from the audience. Um, oh, this is an interesting one that just popped up. And it, I think it picks up on what we were just saying. And anybody can answer. So the question is, are you seeing a shift in attitude um, where we were first working at home and some feel now that we're living at work? Even though work was increasingly bleeding into our home lives, now it is our home lives. There's a lot of, and this goes back to the mental health um, topic as well. There is that feeling, that strange sensation that we should have, and it goes back to our first poll, everyone wants time, we should have more time because we're not commuting and where's all that, where did that go? And yet we seem to have less time than ever and we seem to be working more than ever, um, which is a, you know, esoteric bigger topic maybe than, than we have time to get into, but we'd love the perspectives from, um, let's go to you, Amanda, on, on that. So we were really quick to shut down and said from the beginning, we'd be really slow to go back. So we just set expectations. We always try to say it's not going to be for another three months. We've now announced we're not going back. We're not reopening the offices this year. So we've really prioritized people setting up good hygiene. Have a beginning, middle and end to your day. Uh, unplug, create boundaries and things like that. And what we're hearing now is that 70 or so percent of our employees don't want to go back to work five days a week that the, uh, the lack of commute, the, the having dinner with your family seven nights a week instead of three, like people have changed their perspective and are getting pretty good at containing it. Um, the one thing I would say that we are failing at, and I observe it a lot, is that we are not getting people to take vacation. Because there's nowhere to go, people yeah. aren't realizing how important it is 
to take time off. So you say I'm going to take Friday off, but then you're checking anyway, and it wasn't a restorative day. I think if we could do anything for people's mental health, it is get them to get away, even if they're still just in their you know studio apartment in Chicago, to do something besides work. Because if we keep waiting until we can vacation again, it's not going to be this year, and that is not good for mental health. Um, so I, it, for us, it's, I'm, not, I'm not hearing that people are working around the clock. I'm hearing that they like the time back, that they are over the stories they used to tell themselves that I have to have the customer meeting in person or we have to talk in faces. Like that I'm hearing more and more that like remote asynchronous work works for me and I like my extra time back. So maybe office life is way overrated. That's where we're, we're on the other side of the spectrum of people going, this is pretty great. And, and by the way, as someone who like dressed for work for 25 years and now wear sweatpants every day, I'm not complaining. <laughs> and I think that speaks, I think the numbers that you stated are very consistent with other polls and surveys about the percentage yes, of people who don't want to go back. And it speaks volume. I mean, again, you've been rated so highly for your culture. So a place where people love the culture, and I, I will humbly say Zeno is very similar, love the culture and they still don't want to go. <laughs> they still aren't racing back and we're not going back anytime soon either. So it's an interesting uh, uh, paradox. Panelists, anything in our final two or so minutes? Anyone else want to add any closing thoughts? Can I, I just go back? Oh, sorry. No, of I was course. Just say oh. that you have to put down a trusted attitude to your employees. You know, treat them as partners, ensure that you've got their support. Um, it's not about an, uh, an eight to five day, a nine to six day. It's like just enable them to do their job as long as they get it done. Does it really matter that they take an hour and a half lunch break? No. Um, so to me, it's just like empower people, feel like you've got their back, you're supportive and you'll see the rewards. And take, yeah. the, vaca and take the vacations. Couldn't agree with that more, Amanda. Ron, <laughs> any, any final thoughts there? I'm just happy that the state of Illinois is in an innovation conversation. I think that's amazing. Um, so we're here to play, we're here to kind of move things forward. And, um, I can honestly tell everyone on this call that we see the residents as our customer that may not have been the way it was before, per perhaps, um, not a transaction. Everyone is an avatar on our roadmap and we have an avatar for every single type of resident we have, including my 74 year old mother who lives at home and I'm delivering goods for her. So she does not escape. So I'm doing the best I can, but um, we definitely have your back. So thank you for all the support. What a great place to end. Luke, I think you've got some closing thoughts for us. Yes, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Amanda, Ron, Brian, Matt. You were awesome rock stars, just as we knew that you would be. Um, thank you for sharing all of your insights. And Matt, thank you for uh, Theron uh, being the presenting sponsor today. So just some clo closing thoughts. You know, we came up with this idea of innovating more with less. We thought about less in terms of the lens of, you know, less people, less time, less money. You know, Amanda, you mentioned less clarity and, and security. We're thinking the, the negative way about less. But, you know, today I also heard you talk about less, uh, less red tape and less slowness to implement ideas that really help people, uh, less complacency, less people doing things without asking themselves, you know, why have we been doing it this way? And, you know, as a result on the more side, um, you talk about more bears chasing us, which I would have thought was a bad thing, but now I see why it's a good thing, uh, to more realness and truth with customers and employees and, and all this leads to more opportunity, more hopefully breakthroughs, as you mentioned, Amanda, and, and more perspective on, on what really matters. So, you know, I, I feel optimistic about the future that innovation is indeed, uh, the time is ripe for that. And thank you all for sharing your thoughts on, on how we can get there. And then last things, you know, our organization, Chicago Innovation, we are here for you everyone tuning in to support people interested in innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, three upcoming dates, July 31st, deadline to nominate for the Chicago Innovation Awards. So do that if you've got a great new product or service. August 6th is our in Gallup, and August 20th is our uh, next virtual event after that called Innovations for Everyone, Focus on innovation, equity, and opportunity. And we're excited to be here uh, to support this great community in Chicago. Uh, until we see you next, Enjoy the rest of the summer, uh, be well, and we'll uh, see you soon. Thanks so much again for today.